Welcome back, uh, brothers and sisters in Christ, and uh, um, and we're all uh, connected to our uh, toward one thing. Um, we are connected together, and um, we're the body of Christ. Uh, we we talked about uh, being citizens of heaven last time, and uh, that there are uh, rights and responsibilities because. Um, with a citizenship, obviously, comes uh, what you are supposed to do as a member of that society. And um, there are things that you actually can claim as your rights, um, the privileges, so to speak, um, that are given to you because of your status as a member. And so, um, just like that, we, we talked about um, heavenly citizenship that is given to anyone who puts their faith in Christ. And as the Lord and Savior, and um, they are immediately joined. They're, they immediately moved from death to life. Um, we're talking about second death to eternal life. And um, even though, uh, because the kingdom of God is um, already and not yet, we talked about this, that uh, it came with uh, Jesus' uh, first coming. Um, however, because we are living in a fallen world and um, he has not come yet, well, the first time he came as a sacrifice. The second time, when Jesus comes back, he's going to come um, as king and a judge and he's going to reign over the world and his full manifestation of presence will be, um, will fill the universe, fill, fill everywhere. Um, so then that, that's when we will... Um, no longer have, not yet, um, well, we'll have already and fully. Um, so we wait for that moment and even the, even the environment, uh, even the trees and land and ocean and everywhere, they are actually longing and they're groaning for the salvation to come. Um, we, we can kind of see it. Um, I met some of my friends actually talked about this a couple of weeks ago and uh, why are we more environmentally sensitive and awake uh, these days compared to like 30, 40 years ago, right? Um, it's because we see uh, the, the nature of being deteriorated. We see um, extinction of species <laughs> instead of, you know, uh, expansion and um, we see the result of what we have done. Just uh, wiping out the forest in Africa and Asia and you know certain parts of the world uh, for our advantage mostly. And um, just uh, throwing all our trash into the ocean and you know, uh, even um, sending our trash to the third world countries where uh, more disadvantaged countries where uh, we, we bury them and the land is just contaminated and it, it's toxic. We've seen kids, um, for example, playing on top of um, um, trash mountain, garbage mountain, and everything is burning and they're playing there and they're smelling and all the toxic ingredients of the, um, of the trash. And so we <clears throat> have seen, even if we um, don't watch news, like I don't watch news very much, but I'm still aware. Um, and we've seen destruction that we have caused. And so nature and children and um, the whole universe is actually waiting for the full um, expression, full manifestation of salvation to come. And so um, Christ is coming and he's coming back um, soon. And so we talked about these things and today we're going to actually um, talk about um, you know, a little, uh, a little bit about Paul, uh, not because he wants to talk about his personal background and he wants to um, take our attention uh, on himself. No, that was not the purpose. It's because he want, wants us to understand from his own personal experience, because, you know, Christianity is experiential. It's not theoretical. It's not about we training ourselves to um, go up the spiritual ladder to reach a certain point um, and uh, we could become like God or we become uh, a better being. It, it's not about that. Um, Paul, um, his, his experience, he thought of himself as righteous before, but after meeting Christ, all of his um, 
ideas about himself and what righteousness is and what uh, revering God is, uh, his perspective is completely changed and he wants to share that with us so that we can have a better understanding of what the gospel is and um, he also wants to humble himself. He wants to let people know that he is merely a servant of Christ, a prisoner of Christ. And so um, how gracious God has been in his life and that same gracious God will be gracious to you. And um, the one who made me um, uh, the, the worst of the sinners become uh, a righteous, truly righteous, not the self-righteous one, but truly righteous one, um, he will, uh, he is available right now. He's watching over you and he is with you. That's what he was trying um, was trying to convey. And so um, today we're going to actually talk uh, a little more in depth about that. So let's uh, start with a prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for uh, this precious morning. And Lord, uh, we come before you uh, with a thankful heart in anticipation, um, in anticipation of the literal freedom that we might enjoy um, in the near future. And Lord, uh, we've experienced what it is like to be homebound, to be, uh, to feel like a prisoner. And um, Father, so in this moment of um, uh, frustration and uh, confusion and um, worries and um, concerns, Father God, we lift up our hearts to you um, in anticipation that you will bring, um, that, that you yourself is light and you're, you are the hope, and you're the only hope that we can hold on to. And so, Father God, we still keep our expectations high because of your goodness and your faithfulness and uh, because you're almighty and you're sovereign. Father, that's so we did dedicate this time in your hands. May you speak to us uh, through your word today so that we may be renewed in our bodies, on our, in our souls, in our spirits. Father, we thank you. The Holy Spirit asks you to um, continue to do your work through this class and that uh, your will be done today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, so we're going to actually uh, dive into um, Ephesians chapter 3. And um, so that we can actually um, have a big picture of what we're about to discuss. So I'm going to read it for you. Ephesians chapter 3. For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, Surely you have heard of the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is the mystery made known to me by revelation, as I have already written briefly. In reading this, then you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made to know, made known to people in other generations, as it has now. Been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of His power. Although I am less than the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God, who created all things. His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are your glory. For this reason, 
I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. This is a powerful passage. I'm glad that we're dealing with this. All right. So um, the, the, sub, the subtitle that is given to this part of the passage um, by, um, and I, well, this is an idea Bible, right? Um, the author is, or authors, is um, God's marvelous plan for the Gentiles. So um, let me briefly touch on uh, Jews and Gentiles um, just to remind you. So, who are the Jews? Jews versus Gentiles. All right, so, um, well, Adam and Eve are the only perfect human beings who are made by God, who are chosen by God, who are uh, one mind with God, one heart and one mind with God who were completely friends with God, right? I mean, there are people who are later called as friends of God, but then um, uh, it's, it's after the fall. And so um, things were really not the same. That does not keep us from becoming uh, friends of God because Paul, um, according to the guidance of guidance of the Holy Spirit has actually revealed to us that, that we are actually um, friends with God. We became, we, we, we were the enemies before, but by Christ's blood, because we've been washed away, we became friends with God. And so, um, yes, um, blood of Christ is powerful. It reversed all the situations. However, um, we have to acknowledge that the fall happened by um, Adam and the fall of human beings happened by Adam and Eve. And since then, things are just not the same because uh, there are consequences to our sins. And so um, anyway, um, there were um, people, so like as our generations passed, people began to fall away further and further and further and further away from God. And finally, there were so many group of people on this earth who did not know God uh, nor acknowledge God's sovereignty over the universe or their lives at all. The, there were people like who were born in such a family. Like for example, I don't know. Um, I don't know what is a good illustration, but um, those people who actually move out of the country. Okay, so uh, there are people who left their home countries, and especially in um, the city of LA, we have uh, all kinds of people who left their home countries and came here. Um, I have some Armenian friends who uh, escaped out of their political situations. Um, I have some Turkish friends who actually uh, left the land because it was so um, unstable with wars and um, once again political situations. Um, I have some um, Chinese friends who actually came to the United States for um, religious freedom. I have um, um, I have people who, who have come to the United States for various reasons, for maybe um, in order to do business and things like that. And for, for whatever reasons are, um, there are so many people here who have left their home countries. And so they um, usually maintain their language and their culture to some degree, even after 30 years and 40 years of having lived in the United States. But their children who are actually born and raised in the United States um, start 
kind of uh, blending in with the culture that they grow up in. It's, it's a natural process, and the kids learn by just you know observing and observing, you know, like um, the um, process of enculturation, and uh, you get you get used to the culture, and you get to adapt adapt to the culture, which is uh, it's, it's a good thing. So they turn out to be somehow uh, bicultural, bilingual. Um, maybe stronger in one uh, culture and language versus the other. And then the third generation comes, you know, their kids, you know, oh, you know what, they're pretty much Americanized and, um, you know, they may um, maintain some um, aspects of their own original culture and language, but, you know, certain parts are kind of lost, right? And so, um, well, this is not to say it's good or bad. Um, it's just a phenomenon, right? And so over generations, you get to lose certain aspects um, because just because you're living in a different environment and in a different culture uh, filled with different language. And so then, um, after just so many generations have passed and being born in an environment where people do not talk about God at all and do not have personal relationship with God any anymore, uh, where people don't even acknowledge that God is God or God even exists. And so then because of God's grace and because it, of his mercy, people still continue to live, live without acknowledging God. Yeah, God has been really, really patient with um, all of us. With me. Even uh, as I look back, like when I didn't know that um, God is that God, you know, that Jesus is the only one true God. Um, he was still gracious to me. Um, I was not left out. I was not cut off from the generation, but rather he waited for me patiently and surrounded me with people who were praying for me, who would reach out to me with the gospel. And so I'm sure that that was the case um, generations after generations. And I can see God's heart is so broken because people do not acknowledge him. His own people do not welcome him. But anyway, um, so having grown up in that kind of environment, and say Abram was one of them. Abram, well, and back then he was Abram, right? Abram and Sarah. Abram uh, was born and raised in um, Chaldean of Ur, and it was a land where people did not know God at all. And he grew up in that kind of environment. So whatever his like original ancestor, you know, um, did. By, by his time, but he did not know God. And that's why he um, was involved in carving out of idols and false gods who cannot talk, who cannot listen, who cannot answer your prayers, who cannot act, who are not living, right? And so he grew up in that kind of environment, which is not surprising. And so then he did not know God. So by definition, because he did not know God, I would say he was a Gentile at the beginning, right? But um, God picked him, and we don't even know why God picked him. There are different theories, but from my um, shallow understanding, I believe that um, he was not cho chosen because of any merit. I don't think so. Yeah, like I like I shared with you before. I think the only thing that um, God really liked about him was his obedience. Like, yes, sir. Okay, at the age of 75, like, yes, I will pack up and tell my family to pack up and we're gonna just take off. Without a map, without a GPS, and without a, a tour guide, like, we're gonna just leave and we're gonna follow your lead. Not, that's tremendous, but that's what any, anyone can do. Like, you, it doesn't require any kind of noble background, you don't have to come from a good family, you don't have to have a lot of education, you don't have to, indeed, you know, Abraham was not from that kind of family, right? It does not require anything, it just requires obedience of the heart. And that's what God really liked about him. But um, if we take a look at Abraham, like there was nothing that was really great about him, um, that he should be cho uh, chosen, but God chose him. I think it's like that with everyone. I think it's like that with me. I think it's like that with you. Whoever says yes to him, it's just overjoyed. He's just delighted. Wow, 
I found someone who is obedient. That is so like the characteristic of Trinity. Like they mutually obey. They are in complete um, consensus. They are in agreement and there is only harmony and there's no disputes. Um, wow, someone who agrees with me, gosh, I found somebody and so he just picked Abraham. But um, Abraham, over time, through his rough journey, um, it must have been really not easy. I mean, you know, staying home is really not easy, isn't it? However, going out to the wilderness and having to travel, like not knowing where you're going to end up, and especially if you're an old age and you really want stability, um, your family can complain, like, where are we going? Like, today? Like, um, so you probably had to throw up with that. And in the midst of that, he still obeyed. Um, although he um, fell a few times, he still obeyed. And yes, um, God chose to use him. And so long story short, he became the father of all nations, meaning uh, father of faith. Yeah. Isn't he like um, one of the people, like the prominent names in the hall of faith in Hebrews chapter 11? He's a father of faith, and so when God chose him, he became the, the first generation Hebrew. Yeah. And so then Hebrew, which, you mean, which means the Jews, the same thing. And so um, God's chosen people, and by the way, God chose them um, for no reason, right? But God's chosen people, basically the definition of the Jews is God's chosen people. Um, it looks like a, an ethnic group. And, and because they, over time, by laws, they were forbidden to, from getting married to any unbelievers, right? And then, so they were intermarrying within their community. So then, yes, after so many generations, it looks like an ethnic group, right? Um, however, um, that was not the definition, right? The definition is um, God's chosen people. So, well, who God chose? Not because he has favorites, you know, he, he's not playing favorites, but he was just simply searching for someone who has the potential to truly worship him, and he found one. And so, that's called the Jews, right? And then, the um, rest of the people who do not know God, are Gentiles. And, uh, and over time, once again, because the, uh, the believers or believers of God, Yahweh, uh, look like they started intermarrying within themselves, um, so that it looks like uh, an ethnic group. Then, later on, it looks like ethnic group, the Jews, versus the other ethnic groups, uh, Gentiles. But at the beginning, uh, that was not the definition. So, I'm just clarifying. So, Jews versus Gentiles. Now, um, so Paul talks about Jews and Gentiles. He says, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles. So uh, let me talk about the prisoner of Christ Jesus um, later on. But for the sake of you Gentiles. So um, obviously the people of uh, Ephesus, the Ephesians, were Gentiles. So they did not know God. And Ephesus certainly was a um, very, very busy place. Um, it was a, um, and many gods <laughs> had their temples there. And so Ephesians definitely did not know Yahweh. However, um, Paul, what, as he was uh, traveling from, um, from uh, Jerusalem to other cities and other countries, of course, um, he arrived in, in Ephesus and he got to uh, spend uh, a couple of years with them and finally he was able to see um, the the new believers there were new converts and then he was able to disciple them and finally set them up as leaders of the local churches uh, of the local church which is the uh, church of Ephesus and then uh, now um, Paul obviously is in, uh, in prison and he's writing to his uh, dear um, Believer community in Ephesus. Now um, he calls himself. Okay, so he's he's saying, okay, okay, I'm a prisoner of Christ Jesus. So it, what it generally means is I'm a slave. I'm a servant of Christ Jesus. But 
What for? And what am I doing? What's my job? Because uh, servants, different servants have different roles in the household, right? Um, of course, servants are supposed to do whatever their masters say that they're supposed to do. However, um, there, there may be some key functions that they play. Certain um, servants are um, actually like they mainly serve in the kitchen, right? Um, other servants may be um, given the responsibility of cleaning, cleaning up the house. And still other servants are given the responsibility of um, organizing the, the shoes when the guests come and washing their feet and, uh, you know, primarily providing them with water and things like that. So there are different functions and um, Paul is defining himself as well, prisoner and servant um, are two different concepts, but then, you know, there, are, there is a similarity. Now, prisoner of Christ Jesus for the sake of you Gentiles, like, why am I in prison? Why am I serving you? Okay. Um, it's because Christ has commanded me to share the gospel with the Gentiles. Ones who are not the citizens of heavenly realm, the ones who are not um, the followers, the ones who are not the children of God, who are the enemies. Uh, the ones who were um, not part of the family. Right? Now you're part of the family. And um, it's really interesting. Peter was a, a messenger for the, the, the evangelist, for the Jews, because the Jews, the God's chosen people, supposedly, they... Um, they believed in God, however, they did not acknowledge Jesus Christ, who is the very Messiah that had been waiting for thousands of years when he actually uh, appeared before their eyes. They did not acknowledge him as the Lord and Savior. And Paul was one of them, too. Um, if you remember Paul's conversion experience, we talked about this a few weeks ago, and I um, Try to show you a video, but you know, I, I think um, because this class is being taught, in, uh, taught online, there's a little bit of uh, difficulty with that. Anyway, so basically, Paul um, fervently worshipped God. He was a God fearer. He was a Jew of the Jews. He was taught under the teaching of Gamaliel, which you know, who was a very, very famous um, scholar. And anyone who studied under him was um, be respected in the community um, and he was a Roman citizen and he um, did not have to live a life of suffering or difficulties at all however um, he even loved God so much to the degree that he wanted to really really uh, actively keep the law and uh, wanted to reinforce the laws of God to other people as well and so he went around like a police, and uh, out of his self-righteousness, he started to kill Christ followers, thinking that Jesus was preaching, like he did, obviously he did not think of him as a Messiah, and also um, he thought his teaching was blasphemous. He himself is claiming uh, as God, like he, he is saying that he's the son of God, and that's blasphemous. And so like, uh, we have to kill him, we have to kill his followers, was uh, his it's, uh, well, um, Jesus was long dead, you know, by, by the time Paul was uh, going around, right, and uh, persecuting church, right? um, meaning Jesus uh, died, um, but rose again from the dead, and uh, he ascended to heaven, so he was not no longer there, but Paul just thought, you know what, um, we killed um, him who claimed to be the Messiah, because he did not know, right? And uh, now it's time for us to actually purge um, this generation of the Christ followers because they're also blasphemous. Right? And so he was doing that. But um, on his way to Damascus, in order to persecute more people, more believers, and to kill more people, he actually was struck, struck down by a blazing light, right? And he, he became blinded and he heard the voice like the thunder saying, Paul or Saul, Saul, he's a he break me. So, why are you persecuting me? And he's like, he is just so confused and so surprised. And there was authority and the voice, of, obviously. And he, while he was uh, like, you know, um, um, lying flat on the ground, he said, 
who are you, Lord? And the boy said, I'm, the G I'm Jesus Christ. I'm the Christ that you are persecuting. And basically what Jesus was saying that we talked about this uh, before too, right? He's the head. Jesus is the head. And um, the believers are the body. And so when you persecute the church, which is the Christ body, then you are persecuting me, is how um, Jesus was said, uh, what, what, what he was saying. Now, um, so he was blinded for three days, and Ananias actually came and laid hands, and his eyes were open. And in the midst of um, those three days, I mean, although the Bible does not describe in detail, we can easily kind of um, imagine, utilize our imaginations. During those three days, he was probably very, very much um, confused. He probably repented a good God big time, and he, um, he was completely shaken, and that was a paradigm shift moment as well for him. And so when, when his eyes were open, that, that was a symbolically representing his spiritual eyes being open. And so it's no wonder. He talks about may uh, the Holy Spirit open your spiritual eyes so that you can understand the depth and height and you know um, the length of, of Christ's love for you, that uh, you will understand the mysteries of heaven. Because he himself experienced that opening of the eyes, right? Now, um, so then he was a proud Jew, but oh, once again, he, he became, uh, he came to realize, oh, I was a Jew, but without faith. I was not, not like a Jew. I did not know God. I did not know Christ. If I did not know Christ, then I did not know God. He finally came to understand it because uh, Jesus is a perfect representation of Father God. So um, the thing is, because we're living in a fallen world and because we are spiritually limited, uh, even as believers, we cannot understand God fully, right? And He's so uh, vast and He's so uh, full of wisdom and He's so mysterious and He's holy, He's different from us. We cannot um, understand Him fully by any means. Although he reveals himself in a very simple way so that we can understand a great deal about him. So there is a, a little bit of um, knowledge that we can, well, we can know him, but we can't know him fully. But um, if you want to know who Father God is and how he is like, um, you can actually come to know Jesus Christ uh, through the scriptures, especially, and especially by the uh, revelation of the Holy Spirit. You can see how Jesus acted, what his way of thinking was, and um, what he was pursuing, uh, what he's telling us to do. And he makes his commands very clear, and he never made it difficult for us, right? And so I'm not saying that it's easy peasy to be his disciple. No, we have to actually reach, you know, we are in the process of reaching the level of full commitment where we can lay down our lives for Christ. But he allows baby steps, and he made the um, commands very clear. So, first of all, before we try to understand something more mysterious, we should understand those simple commands first. We should, well, we, anyone can understand those simple commands, and we should put it into practice. We should do it as followers. You know, we should just do it. Then, Holy Spirit reveals more and more and more. So I talked about the fact that Christianity is about believing is seeing rather than seeing is believing, and it's about doing and then um, understanding more. So more truth is revealed to those who basically follow and put into practice the Word of God. So that's part of the mystery. Yeah, and then, um, so then he realizes, you know what, I was a... Uh, like a brute beast before you. I mean, this is the psalmist expression, but um, it seems like, you know, um, that was sort of uh, what Paul felt like before God. I was a brute beast before you. I was worst of the sinners. So we're still the sinners. And so I was actually worse than the Gentiles. 
yeah, who by definition got uh, the, the ones who did not fear God. And because uh, the, the people who were chosen by God wanted to keep their faith so pure, and um, there were laws that forbade them from uh, associating with non believers, non uh, Jews, or people who did not fear God. And certainly not, they were not supposed to marry them, right? So then um, they wanted to keep a distance as much as possible from them. Now, Paul, as he realized, wow, I'm the worst of sinners. And Christ has been so merciful and gracious toward me that he did not, he struck me down with a blazing light, but that was his mercy. I deserved worse than death because I killed so many people, right? Um, even if he did not kill people by his own hands, he was watching and he allowed and encouraged people to kill them, kill the believers. Uh, meaning that, that, you know, he was involved, he was involved, actively involved in killing. And so then, wow, you know, I am like a brute beast before you. I'm the worst of the sinners. And then um, God appointed me. He said, well, Paul, you shall go to hell. Like, God did not say that. No, he said, I'm making you uh, a messenger of the gospel. I'm making you an apostle. Now, an apostle is uh, a person who goes around to different areas or perhaps different cities and uh, different countries establishing churches, planting churches. And uh, they raise leadership there and let the local people take over leadership. And then they go to a different region to plant the church and you know, go through the same process. So they uh, move from one place to another. They do not own, uh, well, nobody's supposed to own, right? Uh, but he's not, um, they're not, apostles are not staying in one place and to uh, be the senior pastors for 20, 30 years. No, they don't do that. They plant the churches and they move, move on. So Apostle Paul, he was called, Paul was a, uh, became an apostle and he was so grateful and gracious. Not only because he was saved, words of the sinners, was saved. And I'm not calling him worse of the sinners because he certainly, like if you look at his life, he certainly lived the most devoted life of all. However, he calls himself worse of the sinners and he really, it was not an exaggeration, it was not false humility, he was actually thinking of himself like that. And God has been so gracious to me. Then, when God says, go and preach the gospel to the Gentiles, yes sir, by all means, nobody's unclean, nobody is unholy, Nobody should be cut off. I will go and share the gospel because I came to know Christ by grace. These people can know Christ by grace. And surely, I'm going to do everything and anything that I can do in order to help them come to this loving relationship, the covenant relationship with Christ, so that they can be grafted into the vine, so that they may bear fruit. And I'm so excited about this mission. And so that's why you know, he's filled with joy, even in prison, not for his own sake, but as his uh, heart was united with God's heart, he saw God's joy, smile on his face, Jesus in his excruciating pain, excruciating pain on the cross, he foresaw these Gentiles coming back to him, and his heart was full of joy. You know what I mean? His heart was so, so, his, his heart was filled with sadness because these people, they're doing the most grave sin of all, uh, of, of all sins that can ever be committed by human beings is to persecute the Messiah and to kill him in such a heinous way. However, he also saw, he joyfully took up the cross because he saw how many people will be saved through him. And so when Paul met Christ, he became one heart with him and he inherited that heart of Christ. He says, I'm a prisoner of Christ. Sometimes he called himself a servant of Christ. And um, prisoner. So he's, he's in prison and he kind of knows that probably he's not going to be released. He knows that he's going to be probably beheaded one day. And um, it was such a, yeah, it, it happened actually. He knew what was coming by the Spirit and just by logical sense, he probably feared it out. However, he was a glad, um, joyful, 
prisoner of Christ. And he says, I'm a prisoner of Christ for your sake. Because I'm one heart with God, a brute beast. I was saved. And I will certainly be a channel of his grace and mercy to you. And so he defines himself prisoner of Christ. Now, um, for the sake of Gentiles, we, we talked about this. Now, um, we talked about the gospel vaguely known in the Old Testament era. So um, let's go and actually uh, dig up this concept. So, verse 2. Surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is the mystery made known to me by revelation, as I have already written briefly. In reading this, then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to people in other generations as it has now been revealed. By the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. Mm. So uh, there are stages, right? And I'm going to read this again. Um, um, so basically, it can be said. I almost want to divide the era into three different eras, but then um, that's my personal perspective. So um, let me speak to two. So there is an Old Testament era and New Testament era, right? So um, the Old Testament era, so what device is two? This is what? Christ coming, first coming. Okay. So when Christ was born, that made marked the era. Uh, it's a New Testament era. So Old Testament era is uh, when you know God created, which is um, created the universe and universe and first human beings. Um, so Genesis to Malachi, right? And then um, New Testament era is uh, the Gospels, four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Um, I would say synoptics, synoptics, the synoptics, and um, John. Anyway, I will say Gospels. Gospels and Epistles da, 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 to Revelation. So um, then, I think I told you a few times, and if you've been in my course, you've probably heard this over and over again, which is not, um, uh, it's, it's worth repeating over and over again, because it's very important. So the Old Testament era, actually um, the entire Bible, is uh, about Jesus Christ, and let me actually show you the, this um, visual. So it says, all my Christian standard Bible, but uh, whichever version that you have, um, the Bible is divided into two different books, right? And the uh, uh, greater portion, the first portion, okay. so this part is called the Old Testament. And so the Old Testament, I told you, is about what? About Christ to come. Jesus Christ to come, the Messiah to come. And how about the New Testament? So um, there was 400 years of God's uh, silence. He did not speak to his prophets 
for trans people anymore um, because of their hard-heartedness, which is how uh, an era of darkness. And um, finally, Mashiach came at the end of the 400 years. And um, his birth, and then uh, John the Baptist proclaiming, um, you know, uh, he put, uh, paved the way for Judas. He paved the way by saying, repent, for the kingdom of God is near. Which is the same message uh, that Jesus started to preach. Uh, meaning, he is saying, you know, you know, heart hardness is not going anywhere. You are not going to be saved. You're not going to see salvation. If you come with big head and prideful life, just because you belong to a certain group of people, that does not mean that you really know God. If you don't know Jesus, you don't know God. And therefore, prepare your hearts, um, repent, and um, be ready to accept the gospel. Now, so the New Testament is, is about what? It's about Christ who has come for the first time and who is coming back in the end. Yeah. So Christ who has come and who um, will come in the end. So, um, Mishia to come. Prophetic messages, right? So it's more like a, um, like a shadow, foreshadow. And foreshadows, I would say, because there were multiple examples um, in the prophecies, right? Versus uh, the New Testament is a Messiah who has come. And who will be coming? Second time. Now, at this time, um, because they talk about uh, Mashiach, there are some uh, futurist scholars who. Um, studied about the future to come um, 20, 30 years ago, right? And 20, 30 years ago, they did not, they had certain ideas, um, but then it was not clear to them. I mean, it was kind of vague because, well, let's say 50 years ago, okay? 50 years ago, it was kind of hard for them to imagine um, what a computer might look, look like, right? It was very hard for them to imagine well, not 50 years ago. So now, now we have, um, so let's say 100 years ago. 100 years ago, it was very hard for people to imagine that there will be like a computing machine, um, any kind of machine, right? And uh, that there will be robots, it was hard for them to imagine. So like there might have been, and there are some um, uh, incredible scholars who was able to look further into the future and they wrote books about the future and they even drew some pictures of like what a computer machine might look like and when uh, things are automated and things like that. However, um, although they had this uh, brilliant imagination, they could not really quite describe things in detail because they did not, simply they did not have that in their hands. Just like that, when um, the prophets were receiving visions and dreams about Messiah to come, and they started writing down, although they were shown the foreshadows, it was not the real thing. So they had difficulty grappling with that, with those ideas. And so they wrote something down and, and they, but it was enough of a description that whoever saw Jesus Christ, if their hearts were open and if they really had a heart of worship, then they would recognize him, right? But, um, to those people who actually saw the uh, foreshadows, it was not clear to them. It was like a blurry picture. You know, like a, I've been at a beach before and um, there were some like sandstorms that came. Like it was during the winter and 
So um, the sand got into my eyes, and, <laughs> and so like everything looked really blurry, you know. Or um, have you have you had this experience like um, um, maybe you're out in the sun and then like you cannot wear sunglasses and uh, the blazing sunlight is in your eyes and afterwards like you try to get something else like in a darker place and things look so like not clear and that was the kind of thing um, uh, for the people who are living in the Old Testament era and so. Paul is saying the gospel was not known to these people. At least it was a blurry vision. A blurred vision. It's clearly revealed to us now. By the Holy Spirit. like three different eras is because when Christ came, Christ was born. Um, uh, ironically, the people who recognized him as the Messiah were the non-believers. <laughs> These were Magi's from the East and uh, not the Jews. Um, so then when Christ was born, some people actually acknowledged, oh, the Messiah has come. Something grandiose, um, something that really marks the history has happened. So then birth of Jesus Christ, you know, by, by that, and to the degree that, uh, well, I mean, not because he had an understanding of what uh, Messiah was about, uh, he, this uh, king, Herod, he was so afraid that he wanted to kill, off, kill him off so that um, he actually wiped out the generation two years uh, um, old and, and there. And so Christ's birth, reveal something to people. Those who are open-minded, open-hearted. Probably one of the first people who knew were, uh, were uh, yeah, uh, the, the uh, priests were uh, staying in the temple. Yeah, but also uh, by first by Mar Mary, Mary is probably uh, one of the very first people who we knew. Okay. Elizabeth, you know, John the Baptist's mom. Uh, Elizabeth and Mary, they were probably the first ones to recognize uh, the Messiah. So his birth uh, had a meaning, right? A significant meaning, and it had significant things to reveal. So, but then um, as he grew older, and uh, finally when he started his public ministry, when he first went to the synagogue and opened that scripture, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted, to set the captives free. Yeah, when he read the scripture and he closed it and then he said, this scripture, which is obviously about the Messiah, even today, if you go around um, in Israel or any other um, countries that has uh, understanding of the scripture, um, even if they don't acknowledge Jesus as the Messiah, if you open up um, Isaiah 61 um, and let them read the scripture, then they're going to say, oh yeah, it's a prophetic word about uh, Messiah. Uh, they're going to easily say that. And um, so, when he actually closed the scripture, or he blew the scroll, and said, this is fulfilled today by me standing here reading it. It was probably not very hard for people to understand that he was referring to himself as the Messiah. 
and when it started to actually do the miracles that are fulfillments of the um, messianic prophecies because the Messiah would raise the dead, would heal the sick, the blind will open their eyes, right? And uh, the gospel is preached, the good news is preached. Um, it was like a, you know, such a hard evidence that no one could really, really deny. And that is not that why? Because they could not disprove and because they could not, um, you know, delete the evidences by any means. Because uh, everyone knew, <laughs> and it already happened. And the truth, you cannot really suppress. And so then um, they did start to plan on killing Jesus, right? Yeah, simply because, um, number one, oh, well, they were offended, yes. Some, some people thought, just, just like Paul, some people were offended. I mean, he's claiming himself as the Son of God. But there were other people who were like, oh, you know what? Um, we're afraid that he might be the son of God. However, you know, like we don't want to admit that. So let's just kill him and see what happens, right? And um, they saw his resurrection, which made the situation even worse uh, than before. So then, um, before Jesus is dead, there were multitudes of followers, yes. But after his death, um, there were even more convert like people who converted to Christianity. More people. How is it that? That's something uh, to talk about later, but yes. And the gospel is revealed by the Holy Spirit. Okay, now, um, Jesus' birth was very significant, and some people knew that he was the Messiah. And his public ministry was in evidence, like full of evidences that indicated that he was indeed the Messiah who had been prophesied. And then, after him dying and rising again, and then ascending into heaven, he said the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the one who actually uh, reveals truth about Jesus. And he's the one who is with us. He's our friend. He's our counselor. He's our coach. He is supposed to be uh, accompanying us daily. And he's with us only if we open up our hearts and spiritual ears, spiritual eyes, uh, allow him to speak to us. He is the tutor, the greatest coach. And so he reveals the gospel very clearly. Of course, we cannot know everything about God, far from it, but enough so that we can um, keep our faith journey enough so that we can share the gospel, enough so that we can be empowered in our daily life and live a life that is different from when we do not know God. Now, so then, uh, we're like the Holy Spirit. That's the, uh, so then um, it's clear enough. Yeah, the gospel is clear enough for us. Okay, so having said that, uh, because we, um, the, the things that we're going to talk about the next um, is kind of uh, like a, a, a little bit of a shift. Yeah, which is about one body. So um, uh, why don't we actually talk about this uh, next session? Um, we are going to actually talk about, I mean, one this comes is It's a frequently visited theme um, in the Bible in general. So wherever the Spirit of God is, there is freedom and there is unity. And the Holy Spirit, if you have the Holy Spirit, one of the things that you can actually confirm. So there are evidences that can be found. Like So if you have life, you'll be breathing. If you have life, you will be, your heart will be beating. If you're alive, you will probably or you know need some nourishment you need to eat. Uh, if you're alive, you will probably go to the, uh, the bathrooms. Um, if you're alive, then there are vital signs and there are uh, evidences of you living, right? Uh, just like that, spiritually, if you're alive, then there are evidences that you manifest. If you have the Holy Spirit, although uh, Holy Spirit 
it's difficult to figure out and it's like a wind it's like a wind he comes and goes uh, uh, and we don't know where he came from and where where he's blowing but um, there are um, evidences if you have the Holy Spirit with you if you genuinely accept that Jesus as Lord and Savior and the Holy Spirit has been given to you then there are evidences of that one of the evidences is that, is that you pursue harmony with other people, that you pursue oneness with other people, that you try to love other people. It's difficult because of our flesh, because of our old self coming into play, right? But that's the direction. It might be zigzag. It might be like up and down. But eventually that's what you pursue. You try to be live in harmony with other people. You try to... Um, love other people, forgive other people, you try to um, really live a, a life of unity with other believers. Because indeed, uh, we're one body. And so, um, yeah, uh, because we talked about the Holy Spirit, we um, briefly covered what it meant um, to have like evidences. But um, having said that, we're going to come back next, se next session and we're going to continue to talk about oneness. So uh, let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your grace and mercy that, uh, that made us uh, continue to live. Like while we did not know you, while we actively denied you, while we uh, turned away from you and ran away. Father God, I ask you that you were, your grace and mercy will continue to be extended to uh, those who do not know you yet. And Father God, I ask you that you will reveal yourself to um, the people who do not know you, Lord God, even through the situation right right now that we're facing, so that um, our spiritual eyes will be open and be able to see that you are the one true God, that you're the Messiah, and there's no other way to um, to reach heaven, to um, receive the gift of eternal life. There's no other way um, by which we can be saved um, other than you, Father God, uh, other than you, Jesus Christ. And so we ask you, Holy Spirit, to continue to manifest in, in our lives and work in our hearts so that uh, we will, our hearts will not be hard hardened, but rather be softened um, and be open to your gospel. We thank you, Lord, in Christ's name we pray. Amen.